I'm gonna knock the socks off people today with this video. I can't wait. <laughs> If this makes this in the video here, this is all we've been hearing about all week. So you're in for a treat I, today. I, I told you. I told you. I'm gonna. I'm gonna bring it this week, and and I'm, I'm here. This is gonna happen right now. I am focused. I'm paying attention, and I. You told us you went undercover, and I knew that part, right? I know of that, but I do not know what what is about to happen here. So. Come along for the ride with me on our fin tips today. Eric is super excited about this one. Yes, yeah, and this is gonna this is gonna uh, this is gonna upset some people. I'm just gonna be frank. Yeah, I love it. Drama. There, there are gonna be some people. Um, I've I've done the research. I actually put out a little small snippet on on another platform. I can't say the platform's names because you know sometimes they say they flag those. But mm. I the people who sell these policies are furious with people like me. Uh, because so what what I what you got to realize is like these whole life policies all these things there's the all the different trends now bank on yourself infinite banking all these cool concepts and they sound so good and you start hearing about them and people aren't real knowledgeable but what people don't realize oftentimes is is you know they look at me on social media or just talking in general they don't realize I worked in that whole world I actually learned about this kind of stuff and I've broken down policies and looked at all this stuff. I mean, that's where I started was in insurance and I, I hated it. I didn't like, I felt that the yeah. insurance company and the insurance person always ends up making good money. And in the end, the the person who invested in whatever it is just doesn't see, see the long-term returns. It's like a, it preys on people that don't necessarily understand or want to understand the more complex math behind it because all they hear is the glitz and glamour and and if you argue with people, like, and you say, like, well, it doesn't actually work like that, they come back hard, right? Because yeah. the sales pitch for people that have been sold these things is intense. It's perfect. Oh yeah, yeah, and it's and it's it's one of those that people believe in. And you got to believe in what you you're selling. That's that's I yep. learned that when I worked in the insurance world. That's what they told me. You got to believe in this. Well, unfortunately, I just didn't believe in it. The more I looked at it, the more I questioned it. And I'm just an a, a bit of an analytical nerd sometimes. Yeah. And, um, and so the more I saw this, so what, what I had to do was I literally had to go undercover, just as I said, <laughs> I mean, this was, this was legit. I, I should have brought in like, you know, a cool detective outfit or something. Um, and the idea here was, was that I actually went and I didn't want to just go with Joe Blow off of TikTok or whatever the case was. Yep. That was not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was really reach out to a reputable company, somebody who has, knowledge of this and you know markets themselves with this stuff so i was looking at whole life insurance and and all of the strategy of basically borrowing against it living on it all of this versus if what what we would do uh you know as far as investments go well first of all they say this is what the wealthy people do this is what the rich people do the rockefellers so having that be part of my previous life not one of them does this. I, they, you know, Disney supposedly, Walt Disney did this. He did this when he was super young and he had $50,000 to his name just to get started. Then that was it. It was over. He, the people don't realize the surrender fee that he actually paid, which we're thankful he did because we got Disney. But uh, <laughs> there are no wealthy people doing this, right? We, we work with Goldman Sachs and so we get to hear from all the insights of what they're doing. None of them do it. Goldman Sachs isn't offering it to their super high net worth clients. So just keep that in mind when you want to argue back on this one. That's what the wealthy do. Yeah, I think one of the biggest uh, uh, biggest uh, targets that people go after are, are high income earners. And so when I went into this, I remembered that and modeled this as though because real estate professionals, yeah. uh, you know, people flipping houses, stuff like that's a big one. Doctors, people who have a lot more money coming in then they're able to put into just general retirement accounts. Yep. These are the focus because that's what they want to look at. I, that's what we were taught when we worked in insurance was look at the asset value uh, or what they have and what's extra. So like look at what's extra of, uh, after they've maxed out the 401ks, they've done all this. Okay, well you still have, you know, $8,000, you know, to work with here. That's what they focus on. Mm. And it's like, I'm getting frustrated also. already, man. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so what I did was I had to go online. I literally had to, uh, basically take, take the, put in this analysis thing and like enter in my info to get with somebody. And before I like, I'm, I'm not going to release anybody's names. I don't want to release companies because the fact is those people are making a living period. If 
if I felt that they were literally ruining somebody's life, then yeah, that's a different story. I don't think the guy was ruining. I honest, honestly, I, I felt bad <laughs> because the guy was was very nice. I just wanted to get the information to really combat it. Yeah. If if I were to combat it or say, hey, you know what? I need to have a change of heart here because if this is something that's worth it yeah. to people, I wanted to show that. That's true. Yeah. And so so with that being said, I, I went through some calls. I got the illustrations. I actually recorded the call so that I could go back and listen for myself to remember exactly what was talked about. I mean, I work in the industry. I worked in the insurance industry. I work in the financial industry. I knew a lot of questions to ask because this isn't just the normal day-to-day -day stuff. Yep. The normal day-to-day -day person's gonna go in and be like, okay, this sounds great. Ooh, where do I sign? But I wanted to ask multiple questions, you know, like what, what are the rates that I'm borrowing against? Well, what, what happens at the end of the policy? What does it look like? All these different things. So instead of wasting more time on it, because this is gonna be long, this took me literally, I've probably got total research time, uh, the time with spending with, uh, you know, looking into the policy itself, all that. I've got over 10 hours in this. So I ask one favor for this. Please hit the like button because if nothing else, you know, this is free content for you. I'm going to show you everything, all of the research right here. And uh, I think think that's a that's a easy enough ask, right? Pe people that people that hit the like button will agree. But anyone that doesn't is going to leave some comments, man. You're, you, yeah. I mean, Eric asked for it. I just do videos. I just share stats and bring in facts and stuff. Eric's like, hey, man, let's go on this path here and, and to be damned with the comments because yeah. <laughs> here we go. No, I say bring it because the fact of the matter is, is I, I solely believe that I've put the research together that shows everything right here. Yes, there's an argument one way or another on every single thing with this. And the biggest arguments are going to be, well, this policy is crap. Well, let me just tell you that this is one of the most reputable companies out there doing this, first okay. of all. Second of all, they're going to say, well, you know, yeah, but if you put it in the market, you know, the market doesn't have guaranteed returns. Well, neither do insurance policies. I'll get into that. All right. So let's go ahead and check this out. So I actually built a slideshow to go over about this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat see. this a little bit, so I make can. sure you can see too. Oh, because I can see. Okay. You haven't, Dustin has not seen any uh, of this. On brand, on point. I'm oh like yes, it. yeah. So, so the fact is, these are complicated plans and hard to explain, even for someone selling it. Um, people, they literally, I said, if someone doesn't build it right, um, what I'm gonna share, I think that's on the next slide, but we'll see if it's not, I'll go into that. Um, the idea though, is that people are building these things and they don't even know exactly how to explain them. If your salesperson can't explain this to a kindergartner, it's a dangerous product. Mm -hmm. um, a great friend of mine was a financial planner, and when I first started in the industry in general, he told me something, and he wasn't big on this kind of stuff. He did work in insurance and finance, and he always told me, keep it simple, stupid. The fact is, is that the more complicated it gets, Later on in life, at what point are you going to retire? And you're like, what did that guy say 40 years ago, 30 years ago when I signed up for something? Yep. Because that guy's dead or retired, moved on, and they have out. nobody to talk to. So that's that's there. All right. So yeah. So it didn't. It, I didn't have that in there, I guess. But the basis of it is 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 these policies can become a mech policy. Uh, a mech policy is something that is a modified endowment contract. So a life insurance policy is, you know, one thing. When you start to try to use it as an investment vehicle or something that you're putting money into, mm -hmm. if you put too much money into it and try to pull too much out, it becomes a modified endowment contract, which then loses its tax benefit. So there's this whole tax game that they talk about playing, and that's really the the big you know approach to everything in the selling point. Okay, you can borrow from yourself tax free money. You don't even have to pay it back. And you know that's the whole strategy there. Yep. Well, these modified endowment contracts ruin that. So that's that's something that everybody has to really take into consideration. But with this thing right here, so breaking down, you know, if you look at the actual illustration, it it takes 33 years to break even on the guaranteed side. Jeez. So 33 years just to break even on the guaranteed side. Now, remember what I just said about how people are going to argue. Well, investments aren't guaranteed. That's why an insurance company is showing you a guaranteed side because the fact is, is that it's not, there's only one guaranteed side. The other side's non-guaranteed where they're paying you the dividends. Yep. That's, that's the other side of it. And so be like, well, they haven't missed a dividend in, you know, 50 years. Well, you know what? I mean, the stock market's never rebounded past, you know, it never not rebounded. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's the same argument it, or it's a different argument coming from that side of it. And keep in mind that one thing that's always kind of frustrated me is 
insurance companies are allowed to show hypothetical projections, whereas advisors, we can't say, if we continue this path, we'll average X. Well, you'll see graph after graph in insurance policies because they're allowed to do that. It's not yep. technically an investment. Yeah, I actually had someone went in the insurance world when I started and um, I was talking with them and they said, don't ever show the non-guaranteed side. You know, we don't even need to show that hmm. uh, because, you know, we've always paid out something. Well, that was all fine and dandy until this is when I really got passionate about this because I sat down with these people and they were in their 80s and they were sold a universal life policy as though not as much to borrow on, but it, it's going to be there forever. Well, those types of policies, see these whole lives at least have a set rate for everything. Okay. The universal life policies are even cheaper to start with. And then as you get older, the price increases. Well, they were sold on the on the non-guaranteed side of things that basically this policy is going to be in place. Well, this lady was about to die and she had probably a year left and their policy had a few months left. Mm. And I was sitting down with them. I had, you know, basically been handed this policy. I wasn't getting paid anything. I was just wanting to sit with the people and figure out what we needed to do because it was it was not a good scenario. I mean, there I've got eighty year old people literally have put a ton of money in this to try. They said we've put over forty thousand in it. They didn't have a ton of money. Uh, they were sold something, and, and that's where it really struck a chord with me. It's like this is trash, man. All these <laughs> things you got to really be careful. And um, so so going back to to here, this policy that I was shown, it took six years to break even on the non guaranteed side. Okay. So non guaranteed side took six years. Uh, Tell me something right this second. If if you, somebody were to give you $100,000 today and it took them six years to even break even, you wouldn't have them as a client, would you? No, I don't think that <laughs> would go too well. Right? Even in the worst of times, if they bought at the absolute high, it's still, how do you explain that to somebody? Yeah. You know, the calls these people must have to take is just crazy. Well, the, the, the thing is, is there's the cost of the insurance, the underlying cost of the insurance, and that's what people aren't realizing just when they buy them. They're yeah. like, well, you know, you, you're putting it in. It's a long-term play, though. It's a long-term play because, you know, you can borrow against and all this. There's the cost of the insurance with all these things. So no matter what, people are getting paid. That's how these insurance companies stay afloat. If this was a trash policy that insurance companies weren't making a lot of money on, they'd cancel it. They're not, they're not dumb on this stuff. And so that's what people have to realize. So right here, dividends are not guaranteed. The IRS actually says that insurance dividends are a return of overpaid premiums. So that's a quite an interesting concept there. And, and again, people are going to argue this. I'm sure some insurance people are going to you know hit us on the comments here with this one. But the fact is, this is coming from the horse's mouth right here. You know, IRS themselves. Yeah. There's overpaid. no there's no way around that either. It's like and going back to the thing a second ago where the the really wealthy people don't use these. It's because they can't, right? You, you kind of touched on it there a second ago, where you can't overfund a policy millions and millions of dollars, then borrow from it and not expect to have a tax treatment on at least part of that. It, there's, you, you break out of it. All of a sudden, it's like it, it doesn't work for, in the eyes of the IRS, it doesn't work. So the trouble is you, the insurance salesperson can't go find the $10 million you know, rich person. They have to find, like you just said, the doctor, uh, people in that camp where it's like, okay, they can't put enough in there where they'll break those, the bust the ceiling there, but they'll also be able to use it for what we're marketing it for. It's it. I'm gonna let you do your thing because the more I watch, uh, hear you, the more I'm like, ah, oh, okay, why? Uh, you're already confused. It's like people are already confused. What are you signing up for? Yep, yep, no, incredible. Without but yet yeah, Bitcoin, oh, you know, I'm all in on that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, the Bitcoin. The Bitcoin is definitely one of them. So if we're looking here, so the actual policy, because I mean, I want to make sure people understand I, I have the actual policy here. And so the idea with this is just as I talked about at your different rates there. Notice how far he's scrolling until he finds the info. Yeah, you've got, you've got to keep going to get just the info. You've got your six years here. You know, there's your break even on what you're putting in. From there, though, if you scroll down here, so this policy was built, so basically I would fund it for 30 years. Now, when I went into this whole thing, as I said, I kind of handed the guy like the golden goose. I didn't go in saying, well, hey, you know, I'm not maxing out anything, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. What I told him was basically, I'm making, you know, great money in real estate. And I kind of modeled it after a friend of mine because I knew that he he is the golden goose with these insurance products because they love people that can bar want to borrow against it, leverage it to go buy you know more real estate, yeah. pay themselves back, do all these things, 
and you need to make great money in order to have a, a good product that's out there that they're going to be able to sell you. And so, I mean, the premium on this is 110,000 for the first two years and then 60 grand for 28 more years. At the end of this thing though, at 30 years, you have $3,530,934. That's the amount of assets that I would actually have that is cash value in that. Okay. Now that's on putting in $1,840,000 into this plan. Now, if you look over here though, you know, your non-guaranteed side, basically you're actually gonna come up a little bit short, but we're not looking at the non-guaranteed side. I don't- Oh I, yeah, don't I look at that side. I, I, won't even, I won't even pitch it on that because I know that, hey, we want, because we can't guarantee the stock market either. Yep. So, but what I wanna do is really compare, well, what, what if you were to do the stock market instead? And so if we're looking at this thing, so let me jump back into this. So what if I had just invested that money for the 30 years instead? What would that look like? So right here, if I invested the money, and let me just say, I'm getting a 7% return on this money. That's what I projected, which I think is very fair. You know, the market in general, even incorporating in this year, still what, over 9% on average. Well, yeah, but and you're, you're taking out inflation. So it's that's why 9.8% minus inflation is how people get to the seven. So that's fair. Yeah. And so, but Investopedia says the average annualized return of the S&P 500 from 57 till the end of 21 was 11.88%. There you go. So I wanted to put some stats in there for anybody wanting to argue that. Well, where's he gets, I've, I've yeah. heard that before. Well, how, who's getting a 7% return? I'm like, oh, that's okay. actually nine point. I did a video where I said 10% returns. I'm like, that's it. That's it. If you go back the entire life of the S&P, it's 9.8% since 1929. So it's like, okay, people say seven because they go 10% raw minus inflation, 7% net. Yep, yep, yep. And so uh, so right here, so this is the start, because remember, I'm gonna fund first with the 110,000 for the first two years. Yep. Now, stay with me because you may be like, well, this doesn't even apply to me. But the, the fact of the matter is, is this, this is modeled for the golden goose. Yours may not even be that but you can at least see the numbers. Don't focus oh, yeah. on how big the numbers are. Yep. This was me hand, handing him that, you know, hey man, here you go. I'm the perfect client. Yeah, this this is it. Because I didn't want to go in. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to find the real facts here. So 110,000 for two years at a 7% return, air 369,578. So then the next time, if you take that 369,578, and then you put in $60,000 for another 28 years with 7%, you're at 7 million seven hundred. Seven million six hundred thirty-eight thousand fifty-six dollars compared to what, like three and a half million yeah. well, on the other side. But but you can borrow. You can borrow as much as you want, though. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you can borrow it. Yeah. How much so, does that cost, Eric? <laughs> to so, borrow. So uh, so then, like, let's let's look at it from a little different picture here, because how much would you have in net cash after thirty years? Okay. So what I wanted to do was incorporate this now long-term capital gains and cost basis got to make sure you, you understand the precedence of that. But with the cost basis, if you buy, if you put an investment in, let's just say your cost basis is $1,840,000, you pull that out. So we're going to subtract that out. But then from there, you have your long-term capital gains, yep. which are taxed at either 15 or 20%. I'm going to tax them high. I want, I want to show this and like, hey, let's give us a, a bad scenario in a sense. Wait a minute. So you're covering everything here? You're actually covering apples to apples instead of, because somebody's inevitably going to say like, oh yeah, but you have taxes on your, uh, your taxable account there. Yep. Sure. Yeah. It seems like you're going, I mean, I'm not, I don't know, but you're going down the path of, you're going to factor that in. Oh, you're darn right. Ah. Yeah. We got, I've got, I want to factor everything in apples to apples on this because the fact is, is that, that i don't think I'm going to give a fair shake at it if I don't. Yeah. Um, that's okay. But that's my problem. I want to know everything about everything before I do it. Uh, some clients are like that. And I'm like, geez, man, why you drive me crazy. But in the <laughs> end, I'm the same way. I'm yeah, just as I bad. would ask the same questions. This is bad. So th this is just showing, you know, the net cash value here. Reminder, three million five hundred thirty thousand nine hundred thirty four if you were to have it. So if you are a total investment, so over 30 years uh, is your total investment is one million eight hundred forty thousand dollars. That's in. the baseline. Yep. So we're going to have seven million six hundred thirty-eight thousand fifty-six dollars minus that cost basis of that one million eight hundred forty thousand. We're still going to have five million seven hundred ninety-eight thousand fifty-six dollars there. Got it. From there, our long-term tax of twenty percent, which I say is high, uh, based on today's you know rates, that's shooting at the high, the top of that. 
uh, on the growth would be 1,159,611. So apples to apples, we're gonna take the tax out and then we're gonna look at this, 6,478,445 versus 3,530,694. Oh. Sounds like a triple digit percentage difference there, bud. Uh, almost a 3 million difference, just in that, just in that. So, so then though you've gotta look at well, what are the benefits? Because people are going to say, well, well, that's just, you're, you're missing out on the whole point of the plan is to borrow against it and do all these things. So the idea is to borrow against the assets, have tax-free income in retirement. Okay. Well, first of all, if you've got, you know, if, if you subtract all of, all of the, in, the uh, interest or the uh, taxes that I was showing you on the long-term cap gains, that in itself shows you. The, yeah. Well, and that's your cost, right? So your cost in the, uh, on the investment side so the cost is the capital gains, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. cost to have stock or be diverse or whatever it is. And if it does, it's like point nothing uh, to buy an ETF. Let's say you did that. Well, on the other side, you're actually showing those uh, that that uh, payout schedule is with fees included. Yep. Right. So there's no there's no even right there is apples to apples because you're you're putting in any cost on both sides, and your cost is capital gains versus whatever it costs for the the policy. Yeah. What is the cost for the policy? So the cost... Does anybody know? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because you have to break it down. It all depends, but it doesn't really get shown fully in the, in the yep. actual illustration. It's never shown. So if we're looking here, the idea is, you know, is looking at what you can borrow against it. Um, what's not taken into consideration, though, is the fact that you have inflation. Okay. So you've got the... Whoops. Let me... I'm jump, jumping ahead of myself there. Let me get back to this screen. Let me see here. Did so much so quick on this thing and got it got it all together for you. But so to borrow it, here we go. So to borrow, what they're not telling you is there a there's a fee of six percent to borrow your own money. Yep. And it's like, well, but you're getting this dividend off of it. Yeah. There's a strategy, I think maybe next week you can talk yeah, about. Yeah, I'll show you. That's an this easy strategy. Way. You can do that already. It's already free to do everything he's about ready to tell you. That's the fascinating thing. Is yeah. Like, Holy cow. So not only that, but what they're also doing here is they're showing you this number. And they're, he told what the whole plan was, was, hey, what in 30 years, you can start taking $205,000 from this plan. Okay. But it didn't account for inflation. So without accounting for inflation, I'm looking at this plan, and that's 497588 in future dollars in 30, in 30 years if we account for a 3% inflation. And just to point it out, make, make the obvious here, the returns that you were calculating on the investment side, those were inflation adjusted because you're backing out from the total return or from the raw returns. So remember, raw return was 10, take away inflation of three. Granted, it's higher now, but you end up with seven. Yeah. So so the plan sold on having 205,000 in tax-free income until 90, and then having 174,000 remaining for inheritance. Okay. So at the end of the plan, even if you're borrowing all this money and taking all this out. Yep. and you're not worrying about having to pay it back because you're basically continuously borrowing from it, you'd still have 174000 So I went into our software, Nest Egg, that we talk about to look at this, and I modeled it with a 70-30 model portfolio, so not 100% aggressive stocks. Okay. I wanted to look at what it was. So it's quite interesting, actually, the cash flow uh, value here, if you were to get, you know, a cash flow works in a linear fashion, so, mm -hmm. you know, single digits. We've talked about that before. But... Um, it's seven million six hundred fifty-six thousand six hundred sixty-eight at age sixty-four. You know, at retirement, that same thirty-year mark. Yep. Now, if we're looking here, the projected assets remaining when modeling the same two hundred five needed from sixty-five to ninety. I, I actually had an issue here because I wanted to model this looking at you know if I still got that same two hundred five thousand, but this software is going to incorporate in the tax. Okay. I actually have it at two hundred sixteen thousand yeah. instead of two hundred five. And then the tax, for whatever reason, isn't accounting for it being a uh, long-term cap gain. So it's it's messed up. So this is actually showing you like a way higher tax. Yeah, much higher. So if you're looking at this still, you have a 95% probability of success, but your projected assets ba based on this, 17,450,957 still remaining. At death. At death, mm. which we didn't calcul calculate for inflation because remember, we weren't looking at that. We're comparing apples to apples. Yep. So you're able to live on 205,000 a year, actually more than that, and also still leave 17 million to your kids. Yep. Well, and just pretend, like he said, the numbers are big, right? So he used 110 for two years to start the policy, 60,000 a year after that. 
take take ten percent of that. Say you did even just uh, what was it? It'd be eleven thousand, and then six thousand a year, right? So you're you're at one point seven million. So don't let the the big number scare you, but m let the idea of hey, at death you still have all this extra money, which by the way, at the moment the government says you get a step up in cost basis. Yeah. So you're not saying, well, I'm leaving 1.7 or 17 million to people and they got to pay taxes. No. What was the value of the investments on the date of your death? They get to take over. I don't know if that stays, but. It, yeah, there's some things there with, you know, depending on a state planning tax, like yep. there's eventually you cross over that threshold. Oh, yeah. But, but yeah, you've got that. Um, so let me point this out to you. Always say I finish it. I've got like a drop left. Boop. <laughs> oh, yeah. so, That's how you know it's, all, it's almost done. He's got... <laughs> so I finished with coffee. So we're wrapping this up. So I also said, okay, because some people are going to say, well, but there's no risk in this this side of it with things. You're right. There's no risk, but there's hardly any return either mm -hmm. overall. If you brought this down to a 50-50 portfolio, oh, a balanced yeah. portfolio, mm -hmm. you still are projected in the same scenario to leave over $8 million yep. to your heirs for this policy. You or could, not policy, but this plan versus going with that policy. Yeah, I mean, you could essentially build a super conservative portfolio, high dividends, low volatility and all that, and you're still crushing this thing with yep. what costs we can see are actually in it. That's that's sold me, yeah. Yeah, so this took a lot of time. Like I say, I, I think the idea here though is to really just know what you're doing uh, be careful when you're looking at policies. Again, I'm not bashing the person that I spoke with was a very nice person. Um, it's more of just the fact that maybe even they're misinformed. They're not really comfortable with the markets as, as a whole, but you got to find a fiduciary. You got to find somebody that's willing to help walk through these kind of things, look at this kind of stuff and, um, and don't get sold. Don't get sold on, on the, the pipe dream of, of anything. I mean, this, this right here is, is strictly facts it's, from a financial plan projecting the same yep. stuff and look at the difference. Well, let's take it a step further too and say, since we're not trying to go after a particular guy, a company or anything, if there's something you think he missed, that's all saved in nest egg, right? Yeah. If there's something that we could model against it, leave us a comment, right? Maybe it's a, a good faith sort of thing that we say, oh, we, we can go back and actually try a different scenario. Let's just see, right? Let's make it, at what point do we break down and say that this policy is actually the best bet versus that. I mean, how far would we have to go? Pretty far, apparently, but yeah, um, we're, we could do that too. So it's not, again, it's not like going out trying to, you know, badmouth people, but uh, that's a tough thing to compare, right? If someone compared that to the policy, ah, that's a tough one. Yeah. And my last thing I'll mention is uh, my wife was taking uh, some sort of test for a license she got, and we were staying in this hotel, and there was a insurance company doing their training in there. And I just walked in and sat down and I just kind of watched for a while. And I had no idea what they were talking about because they were talking about tra like training the people on the in inner workings of all this. But everything was a sales pitch. Every comment, every little line item that they went through, they said, here's how you combat a rejection or how you combat a question. And I'm like, why? Why does it have to be like that? I, was, I, I used to sit in training rooms and have that. They would literally provide us lunch, all these things. And then the people who did the best selling these policies, got the, the most, you know, whatever at the end of the year, whatever they calculated it off of, um, you know, they would, they would throw concerts. They would have, yeah. you know, maybe somebody that was there. They'd have these huge events, you know, all you can drink. They'd fly you to places like France, depending on how well you did. I mean, so much stuff that clearly these insurance companies are, are making massive money off of people. And really that, that fear is what it all boils down to. Hey, buy this. You can borrow against it. You don't have to pay tax, and it's never gonna go down. You know, there, there's all these strategies with it. I could spend, I could probably spend a year on this, but I, I know, you know, we've made this probably the longest video ever at Jazz. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, the uh, they somebody told me the other day, uh, you must be doing well because the the number one industry that makes the most millionaires is financial services. And I go, yeah, but what they don't tell you is the actual industry is insurance. Yep. It's, it's not what I do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, so maybe we sell insurance. You know what I mean? You, you, you in? You seem like you know what you're talking I'm about. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. I'm a, I'm a ter term only. I mean, that's one thing Dave Ramsey and I yeah. will agree on. Yes. Is, uh, ter ter term only. I mean, there. One twentieth of the cost. Yeah. And I get, you know, there's different instances for insurance. I hate insurance in general, but the idea there are needs for it. It's necessary. But, um, this kind of stuff right here, it's just, uh, it's not a fair shake at things and people are literally putting their life savings in it. Yep.
That's horrible. Well, I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Like I said, it was a little bit longer there. If you did enjoy it, leave us a comment. Let us know where maybe we missed the mark or could be adding to it to uh, improve on that. We'll keep the data there so we can use it. And uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks for watching.